Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here and talking about the 17th day of the 7th month. Now, we are in the Feast of Tabernacles and I have been looking through the scripture to pull out some fun facts to share with you guys related to the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, this stuff kind of takes me all the way back to my days in college. Back there in the late 90s, I went through the entire Bible and pulled out every verse that mentioned either a day, a month, or even a year and put them in a table and created kind of a calendar out of it. And then over the years, I would go in and every time one of these days would pop up, I would read the scripture related to that day to see if I can make a correlation between anything that was going on. And that's kind of what we're going to do today. Looking at the events of the 17th day of the 7th month, which takes you over to the book of Genesis in chapter 8. Yeah, this is talking about Noah and the flood. You see right there in verse 4, it says, And the ark rested in the 7th month, on the 17th day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. Now, I thought this would be a really interesting class, because I believe that... The events of Noah's flood actually play out in our spiritual walk. Let me give you a brief understanding of what I'm talking about from this diagram I found over at www.bible.ca. It talks about the timeline of Noah's flood. Now this is how I believe this actually works out in all of our spiritual walk. If you go back to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Or the Feast of Passover, which are the events that occurred in the first month. That's the start of our year. That's the start of our holy year. But if you remember the book of Exodus, when they left Egypt, that was actually the start of that pilgrimage in the wilderness that lasted for 40 years. That was actually the second significant thing that happened to the children of Israel was their observance of the first month's feast. Of course, the first thing that happened to them was the observance of the Sabbath day. We read about that over in the book of Jasher. But after they kept the feast of Passover, even during that week-long feast of unleavened bread is when they crossed the Red Sea and went out in the wilderness where they spent about a year before they was ready to go across the river Jordan and into the promised land now of course it didn't actually work out for them in that way because of some individuals that got scared of giants or whatever but I think that's kind of how it all plays out when you look at the flood of Noah I think the flood of Noah was set as a living parable to see how this spiritual walk actually works so let's look at this chart over here now Notice here that the flood of Noah started actually in the second month. Now, this is really interesting when you're looking at the history and when all of those events take place. Because Noah and the flood actually occurred in the middle of the second millennium here. Of course, Adam and Eve was born in the first millennium. And if you go about 500 years, you end up during the time of Jared when the fallen angels made it with human women and made the Nephilim or whatever. That would have been about midweek of the first thousand years. Well, if you skip ahead another thousand years, of course, that will put you midweek in the second thousand years. Which would have put you during the time of the flood. And that's why you see that Noah's flood waters actually started during the second Passover unleavened bread celebration that takes place during the second month. Most people don't know that there's actually two. Of course, the original, the main one falls in the first month. But there's a story over there in the books of Moses where there was some individuals who were unclean during the first month celebrations 
and our father made provisions for them to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the second month. Well, I think it's amazing how that all plays out when you look at Noah's timeline and how it lines up with his flood starting in the second month. Like I said, I believe this all plays out in our life. So when the new convert is looking for spiritual events that may have taken place during his first celebration of the Feast of Passover and Unleavened Bread, it is actually in the second month that he should see some of those events take place. Maybe not the first. But anyway, the part that I want to draw your attention to today is over here and the event that happened in the seventh month. 157 days after they got on the ark, did the rain stop and the ark rested. So, if I'm right, and then like I said, I'm using a lot of conjecture here, a lot of speculation or whatever. But so you have the new convert who keeps the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the first, maybe the second month. And then he goes through a period of rejuvenation that lasts for about a year. That's very similar to what they went through over in the book of Exodus when they entered the wilderness. You would have a time when they were provided with food and water, even though that may be spiritual food and water. But they were provided with shelter and provided with the law or the book of the covenant during that time. If you haven't done so already, I will advise you to go over and listen to the audio book of the dramatized version of the book of Exodus. It is very entertaining as well as Genesis and Numbers and Deuteronomy. Leviticus not so much, but we'll get something out of it anyway. So when we compare that story in Exodus to what we read about over there in Genesis, I believe there is a direct correlation between the first year that they were in the wilderness and the year that Noah spent on the ark. And yes, Noah spent over a year on the ark. In fact, you see here, it was actually 370 days that they spent on that boat. Well, the 17th day of the seventh month was a very pivotal point in that expedition because that is the time when the waters stopped rising and started receding. So we can compare this to our life spiritually. What does this all mean? If the waters have been rising for 150 plus days and now they're going to start receding here on the 17th day of the seventh month. Now, like I said, I'm late putting out this video, so this may be a few days in the past, but yet your flood waters will still be receding, would they not? And of course, these would be spiritual flood waters. So in the comments section, let's collaborate on what these flood waters would actually represent in our spiritual walk. And just to spice it up a little bit, let's look at the Messiah and how he went about celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. We can read about that over in the book of John and chapter 7. In verse 1, you find the Messiah walking in Galilee because the Jews in Jerusalem were trying to kill him. Now, verse 2 talks about the Feast of Tabernacles. And in verse 3, his brethren is telling him to go to Judea so that his disciples can see the works that he's doing because his brethren didn't believe him. As you see there in verse 5, like they say, a prophet has no honor in his own home. That's why many of you are having a hard time dealing with your families during these feast days. They're kind of blowing you off like you don't know what you're talking about. Well... If the biological brothers of the Messiah blew him off, why wouldn't you expect the same thing, if not worse? In verse 8, he says, Go ye up to the feast. I go not up yet unto the feast, for my time is not yet come. And you see in verse 9 that he stayed there in Galilee and did not go to Jerusalem with them to the feast. But verse 10 says, but when his brethren were gone up, then went he also unto the feast, not openly, 
but as it were in secret. Now jump down to verse 14. It says, now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. So here it is in the midst, some say middle of the week of tabernacles. Did the Messiah actually show up? He waited to the middle of the week. Well, since the feast started on the 15th day of the month, that would put the middle of the week on or about the 18th of the month. Extremely close to the 17th day of the month. I think the important thing for the sake of this video is that he would have came to the temple spiritually at the same time that those flood waters began to recede. In other words, him beginning to teach would have been the beginning of the flood waters going away. So, how do we use this information for our benefit? I mean, do we run out and start looking for a material manifestation of the return of the Messiah? Do we flick on YouTube and go over and start trying to see if anybody is caught a video of him over in Jerusalem somewhere? Well, that would be equivalent to looking out the window expecting to see floodwaters, wouldn't it? This is all spiritual stuff. Like we read over in the book of John in chapter 4. Verse 23 says, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So just like it is that we look inward for the third temple, wouldn't that be the same place that we would look for the Messiah to come in and to start teaching us? Verse 24 says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So in other words, those that's looking for something that they can see with their physical eyeballs is actually in error because he is a spirit and we must worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, let me show you something over here in the third testament of the Bible. This book, the third part of the trilogy known as the Bible, gives us the most information on spirit and truth. Whereas Moses gave us the law and John gave us the love, this third testament of the Bible gives us spirit and truth. Well, let's look down here in chapter 2 and verse 5 for a second. It says, Do you remember that cloud in which my disciples saw me ascend the last time that I manifested myself to them? In truth, it is written that I would come again in a cloud. And this I have fulfilled. In other words, the Messiah has returned. You see here that he actually returned in 1866. The problem is, since we are not aware of the third testament of the Bible and haven't studied John chapter 4 verse 23 and 24 that much, we don't know how to recognize his return. Even today, people are looking for him to come back as a fleshly being. However, like we read about in John, he is a spiritual being. So where is he? Well, in verse 5, he explains that this cloud that he was to return on was a spiritual cloud. Which makes sense if you think about a physical cloud would actually be made out of H2O. Sitting about 7 miles high in the sky. Of course, that is not where we think we ought to be looking for the Messiah to return. No, this cloud is symbolic. And his return is spiritual. The verse goes on to talk about how he started giving his lessons in 1884. This is actually talking about this document that we are looking at here, which is the third testament of the Bible. You can find a link to it in the description of this video, both an audio and a PDF that you could download to your computer. Verse 6 says, I did not arrive as a man, but rather spiritually contained in a ray of light to dwell within human understanding. Have you ever heard people talk about they have the Holy Ghost or they have the Holy Spirit? This is actually what they're talking about. He dwells within our conscious. That small still voice that we hear about is actually our Father talking to us. 
This is what the Messiah was talking about over there in Matthew chapter 25 when he said, Watch, therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. He's talking about that time when you as an individual will realize the second coming of the Messiah. For some of us, this time has taken place in the past. For most of the people around the world, this realization will only be made after the great earthquake and the other apocalyptical events. But there are some who, after watching this video, will make the realization that the Son of Man has returned. That's why he is saying to watch. Because you don't know what day or what hour it will take place. It's an individual thing. It's a personal thing. For some, this is the day and the hour. Now, don't worry about all of the detractors that you'll see down in the comment section of this video. You'll notice that the detractors, the ones who will stand in disbelief that the Messiah has returned, are the same people who are in rejection of the covenant. They are the same people who teach the doctrine of liberty, who say that you can disobey the scripture and only cry Jesus loud enough and believe hard enough and you will be saved one day. Let me be the first to tell you, preparation is necessary. We have to live as the Messiah did. We have to keep the commandments if we ever want to realize his presence. But anyway... So, how do we use the information that we've gathered from this video? Well, let's start searching for him in the third temple, our spiritual temple. Let's learn how to hear him there. That is actually the return of the Messiah. We just have to be able to amplify his voice to a level that we can hear it. And how do we do that? Through meditation, through prayer. Through obedience to the law, which is Exodus chapter 20 through 24, and through charitable deeds. So here are the suggestions I could come up with off the top of my head. First of all, pray. Pray that our Father will reveal himself to you. That he will assure you that he is in fact living inside of your conscience. And that you can communicate with him through the Spirit. Then, as you wait on that proof... Start to think of ways that you could do charitable deeds. Maybe you could go help somebody. Or maybe you could cook a meal from somebody. Maybe you could go mow some old lady's lawn. Or buy a single lady's child some ice cream. Or pray for all of these people suffering from the pandemic. And the fires. And the earthquakes. And the hurricanes. And the volcanoes. And the violence. Then read the book of the covenant, starting in Exodus chapter 20, reading all the way through to Exodus chapter 24, verse 7, making a positive affirmation of what you read in verse 24, verse 7, which says something like, all that ye have said will we do and be obedient to that covenant that you have just read. Then after doing all of that, find a quiet place, particularly close to nature where you're looking at grass and trees instead of concrete and buildings and sit quietly and listen listening for that small still voice then repeat until you recognize that our father is in there and that he spiritually has returned and is yearning to become a part of your life I hope you got something out of this video if you did hit the like button if you didn't, hit the dislike button. Give us a comment on your experiences so you can help others. And Shalom.